is covering disease control largely. And our first speaker for this session um, is a joint uh, co a combination of Tom Passy, who's one of our pathologists at Nia Buddy Smalling, and Katie Stewart, who's a PhD student who works alongside Tom and others at East Smalling. They're going to tell us and uh, share with us some the latest information that they've uh, been researching on apple scab control. Tom, I think you're with us. Yep. Hi, Scott. Um, so. Right. Hopefully you can see my slides. Yeah, that's fine, Tom. If you want to present okay. the presentation more, Welcome that's back, fine. Welcome everyone. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. okay. thanks. My um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about Apple Scab today. Um, so... Um, um, Station sort of two, uh, as I mentioned so earlier you, on, uh, you can probably daydream for 30 seconds. Um, scab is one of the most important diseases of Apple, um, as Amanda alluded to in her talk, um, where she was talking about trying to breeding resistance for scab. Um, it is one of the major issues facing the industry, um, but it has been for centuries. Um, the reason being that the fruit you can see on the right hand side is unmarketable um, and scab left uncontrolled. Um, will in an unfavorable season will um, result in your whole crop looking like that fruit, um, which we obviously don't want. Um, and despite the breeding efforts and knowing that scab resistance is there and can come through and hopefully will come through, at the moment, um, the majority of our popular cultivars that we grow in the UK are susceptible to scab. So what are we doing about that? Well, the main issue that the industry faces around scab is um, removal of products. And this is obviously an issue for most of our um, pest and disease work. Um, we're losing products um, that are effective against our pest and disease problems. Um, and these are due to effects on um, environment, human health, and the um, pressure being put on us um, by and those regulatory bodies um, by consumer and lobby groups. Um, for scab, um, where uh, growers are expecting to lose or have um, products that are currently available reduced in their amount of use allowed or the rates allowed to be used, um, and some of them will get full um, withdrawal very soon. Um, resistance build up to some of the chemicals that are currently used for controlling scab is also a concern, and we need some alternatives. Um, and we need alternatives that can be um, used in IPO programs. And also we need more alternatives for the organic sector because um, their options are even fewer than the um, rest of the commercial sector. So um, a couple of years ago, um, AHDB in their um, final year um, of AHDB Hort, um, were keen to um, have a look at this and see if we could find some alternative products um, that we could um, find for use against SCAB. Um, the products that um, they specifically wanted to test were um, products that are authorised for use in the UK, but not currently on Apple, or that had a high chance of authorisation in the UK. Um, and also they wanted the majority of those products, if not all of them to be um, hopefully um, approved for use in organics. Um, there are a number of issues with that trial in that year. Um, the trial was set up quite late and we had, as those of you remember, that 22 was a very hot season and actually SCAB doesn't like weather being very hot. Um, so that trial didn't go particularly well, um, but the importance of it didn't disappear. So um, for those of you that know the outcomes of as i say hdb horticulture has um now ceased and but then a number of grower levy boards uh, grower boards have developed who are now taking voluntary subscriptions or voluntary levies um and one of those that is british apples and pears and they were very keen to fund this work so um at the start of 2023 they asked us to have another go with this and as it was, the project then actually passed over to Horticulture Crop Protection um, after their setup um, and the project was handed over to them in June 23, as it fits more within their remit than it did in British Apples and Pears. So for those of you that aren't aware, um, Horticulture Crop Protection are the organisation who are going to be looking at um, taking on some of the work that AHDB used to do around um, 
registering new products, um, getting emergency use um, for the for the various um, horticulture sectors. So the work we did um, was looking at um, a number of different products. Um, I'm afraid, as is as was the way for those of you that remember the old HDB sector projects, um, these new efficacy trials. We can't tell you what those products are at the moment. Um, but there are a range of different elicitors, um, biocontrol agents, um, and the purpose of the trial was to test those and see whether they work against SCAB, but we wanted to know whether they work preventatively or curatively. Um, so the products were applied to potted trees um, just prior, a day, either a day prior to um, infection or a day after infection with SCAB. And we then waited a, two or three weeks to see how the scab developed and see if there was any efficacy in these products against the pathogen. And the results of that um, were fairly good. Um, we were testing six different products um, and against um, an untreated control um, and against two products that are currently on the market, Captan and Difference. Um, one being more of a preventative um, fungicide, the other being a curative fungicide. And we wanted to see how these new products um, worked against that. And as you can see from the, just this, we looked at incidence and severity of scab today, I'm just presenting the severity figures here. But you can see that um, one of the products here, AHDB uh, 9711, um, seemed to work both well um, when it was when it was applied both before oh, apologies when it was applied both before um, infection and after infection, which um, is really um, good. We're really pleased with that. And then there were a couple of um, the products that seemed to work well either as a preventative or a curative, but not the other. So HCP uh, nine six nine two seemed to work quite well if it's applied before an infection event, um, but less so after. And AHGB 9808 actually didn't work particularly well if applied before an infection event, but did seem to work quite well when applied after. So actually, the, that's it was kind of uh, good. We weren't expecting all of the products to work. Um, they very rarely do. Um, so to have some products that did show some reduction in the level of scab was, uh, was really pleasing for us. Um, so just to conclude this little bit of work, um, as I say, um, HGB 9711 um, appeared to um, work well against scab both before and after. Um, one of the elicitor products, um, HCP 9692, uh, reduced scab when used preventatively. Um, HCP 9808 um, worked well curatively. Um, Two of the treatments that didn't seem to reduce scab that much were um, bacterial biocontrol agents. Um, as ever with bacteria, as we ever with biocontrol agents, um, it's very difficult. Um, it, they didn't work in this trial. Um, it doesn't mean that they might not work if they were tried and tested over a whole range of different temperatures and humidities and timings. Um, we don't know much about biocontrol agents and these are living things. They're things that grow um, and where we know lots about um, the pathogens and diseases after years and years of study on these things and their life cycles and their epidemiology, we don't always know quite so much about our biocontrol agents. Um, but the chances of them working as our traditional chemistry does, where we can put them on at any point a day before or a couple of days after, they're probably not going to work in the same way. So if we want to start using these products, we need to do a lot more research on them. But um, obviously that costs a lot of money. Um, the plan now is um, to take the products that did seem to um, show some efficacy against scab and trial those properly out in the orchard. Um, as I say, the, this, this trial, small trial was done on potty trees in the polytunnel. So we had a very controlled um, infection. Um, and now we need to see how it works in the real world. So that's a small trial we've done. Now it's looking at um, controlling scab as we traditionally do through the growing season. So after our trying to prevent the spore, uh, spores um, causing infection when they're released in the spring and then the secondary rounds of infection that you get with scab when you have those initial lesions, they produce more spores 
and that just creates secondary rounds of infection. And that's why we need to spray so many times through the season for apple scab, especially in a year with a lot of rain. Um, so that's one aspect to scab, but scab has a whole year's life cycle. Um, and what the work Katie's currently doing in her PhD is looking more at what's happening in the autumn and winter and um, what we might be able to do around controlling scab at that part of its life cycle. So I'll pass over to Katie here. Um, um, so yeah, as Tom just um, presented, he's looking primarily at scab management within the growing season, whereas I'm looking more at um, management outside of the growing season. So in this particular case, winter. Um, so I'm focusing on fallen leaf litter, which is where sexual fruiting bodies uh, known as pseudothecia um, will overwinter. And then come springtime, these will release uh, sexual spores known as ascospores. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. Um, so, oh, I didn't know I had animation, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, so ascospores uh, are the main form of uh, primary inoculum. Therefore, it's important to uh, effectively remove uh, the leaf litter to reduce the amount of scab infection uh, the following season. So currently leaf litter is removed through shredding and burning. Um, however, shredding may not remove um, all of the primary inoculum uh, and burning can negatively impact the environment. Therefore, we wanted to look for, um, uh, look at application of post-harvest control agents uh, as sort of an alternative. And if we found a product, this would either enhance leaf litter degradation or sort of encourage the colonization of um, microorganisms, which can. Um, so looking at the study, um, I applied microbial agents. So I had two um, trichoderma species uh, and a Pseudomonas fluorescens isolate. Uh, and I also looked at a sort of natural product, which is called Vanas, which is a byproduct of the sugar industry. Um, I then weighed leaf litter, um, applied the control agents and then left it uh, them in mesh bags outside under natural conditions over the winter. Uh, and then after several months, I reweighed the leaf litter to determine and compare uh, levels of leaf degradation. Uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, so here are the results uh, from that experiment. This figure is estimating the level of leaf degradation based on how much dry weight was lost uh, as a percentage. Um, so the highlighted uh, plots are showing a significant difference um, between the mean of the treatment groups based on an ANOVA test and a post hoc um, two key HSD test, which compares the means of the treatment groups. Um, and in this case, um, Trichoderma atraviridae um, was uh, significantly reducing leaf litter um, when compared to the untreated control. This control, however, was um, raised off the ground instead of on the ground, like rest, the rest of the treatments. Um, so that's why we wanted to um, repeat the experiment this year. Um, last slot, slide, please, Tom. Um, so for the repeat experiment, um, this is currently ongoing and I plan to collect the results in about March time. Um, but I wanted to do a couple of changes to the experimental setup. So first of all, I included uh, urea as an additional control variable. Uh, and this is because urea is incredibly effective at leaf litter breakdown. However, there are concerns over things like nitrogen leaching, um, which means that there are um, increased restrictions on its use. Um, we wanted to use it, however, as sort of a good comparison for the treatments that we were looking at. Uh, secondly, I placed every treatment at both height positions this time around because I wanted to see whether the impact of the treatments um, was actually from the treatments, so whether they would impact um, it individually. Um, and also I wanted to look at whether the impact of ground, uh, whether there was any impact from ground micro microorganisms. Um, and finally, um, 
this time around, I'll be doing spore counts. So following um, the re-weighing, uh, I'll be seeing how much scab inoculum uh, is remaining following the different treatments and whether any of the treatments are reducing uh, inoculum without fully degrading leaf litter. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get some good results this year. Um, yeah, that's me all done. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you, Tom, for letting me tag on the end of your presentation. <laughs> Thank you to Tom and Katie, and thank you to all the uh, funders of the project and various sponsors and industry partners. There's one quick question I think we've got, which we've got time for. Um, the initial results are positive. Can you please confirm, Katie, what strain of Trichodermica, Trichoderma atroviridae you had in your trial? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I'd have it's to check quick, that. The question is, is it SC1? But perhaps um, if you go into the chat facility afterwards and you can per perhaps uh, respond to that question, Katie, if that's OK. Um, thank you so much to Katie and to Tom. Um, some good work going on there on Apple Scab Control. Um, we now move on to um, probably the primary problem that everybody continually has with apple orchards, and that is apple scab. Um, and... The work that we've been doing has encompassed funding from Growing Kent and Medway, Innovate UK, BBSRC and AHDB, and that in itself just shows how important apple scab is to the industry. Matt Pat Rupar, a pathologist, pathology colleague of mine at NIAB, and also Louisa Robinson, who is a specialist on soil microbiology, are going to explain various approaches they are taking to apple canker. So the floor is yours. Okay. We, there's going to be another double act. It's going to be me, Louisa, and then me again with some cherry um, uh, brown rot at the end. Um, let's hope you see something. Are you seeing this? It's just um, it's just coming up now, I think, Matt. Okay. And it's frozen. Okay. Um, is it frozen on your screen? Uh, yeah, including my video, but you can still hear me, which is... We can still hear you, but it's just possible that your presentation has uh, decided that it's not going to run. Um, I'm gonna try do you want again. to stop sharing and try again? We we do have an another yeah. version of it that we can try and share if you're having trouble. Well, it looks like it's just um, Zoom is a little bit frustrated with the presentation, but... Let's give it give it a minute. Yeah, we'll just give you a second to see if you can. If is is it showing any signs of life, or is it is it frozen again? No, oh, we seem to have lost Matt completely now, uh, unless he's just come out. Um, BB, I don't know whether you're able to look for our. Backup version of Matt's presentation, are you? That's fine. One moment, I will bring it up. We've, we've actually lost Matt completely now, so it yeah. may be a problem. Yeah. It, the problem is, if we haven't got Matt and Louisa, then we can't actually present. What we might try and do is move on. Um, Matt is actually speaking in the second talk as well, mm -hmm. the next one, but we can possibly move on to Tom. See if we can get Matt back. Okay. Um, so I'm going. To, I'm going to propose, given that we're having trouble with this. Um, I don't, Matt. Matt, I don't know if you can hear us. Still, but I'm. I'm going to propose that we move on. Okay. Um, to jump two talks and go to Tom Passy. Tom, are you still with us? And if so. Yeah, I've not had a chance to disappear yet, so I'm still you're, here. <laughs> you're still there. Okay, so I think let's let's move on. Um, Tom is good, was going to talk to us a bit about some work that he's been working on on apple replant disease. So Tom's going to share that with us now. So we're going to jump on and, and I'll um, see if we can try and get Matt back. Uh, fingers crossed, we can. So Tom, sorry to put you on the spot twice in a row, but let's let's take your presentation now. All right, hopefully you can see those slides now, Scott. Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, right. So, yeah, so um, 
I was going to be talking after we'd finished above ground uh, tree fruit disease. Um, we were going to go below ground, but we'll go below ground a little bit now and then go back then. So um, talking about apple replant disease and um, use of soil amendments and some of the work we've been doing on ARD over the last few years. Um, so just to um, quickly cover what apple replant disease is, um, we're looking at poor establishment of trees um, when they've been um, planted in soil that used to have apple trees in. So we've obviously got a finite amount of land um, that is available for growing our fruit. And it's although it'd be lovely to rotate our orchards around into different fields every 10 15 years when we uh, start putting new want to put a new orchard in we don't have the space available for that so more often than not trees are going back into the same ground we had trees in before but that does mean we have establishment issues obviously uh, often with a new orchard um it can show us various different things um stunting shortened into nodes um necrotic roots and um, most trees will survive. Um, they don't often sort of fully die, um, but um, you can see delays with um, yields um, and um, you can see reductions sort of up to 60% during the tree's commercial life. So it is a big problem. Um, what causes apple replant disease has been something that uh, for years caused a lot of debate in the scientific community. Um, and it's because it's caused by a number of different things is effectively the issue. And those um, and the and the reasons um, for apple replant disease to occur and the major causes will differ from uh, country to country, orchard to orchard. Um, and so there's no finite answer as to what causes replant disease. Um, but I think that is now a common and <laughs> um, accepted theory uh, for what causes replant disease. So causal agents can be fungal um, diseases. They can be oomycete, so phytophoras. Um, they can be bacterial diseases. And nematodes um, don't cause replant disease themselves, but can exacerbate the problem. Um, the dominance, as I say, and the cause um, will vary from site to site. Um, and um, but and isn't um, associated with large changes in soil community, but um, often with just very specific microbes, but those microbes can change between orchards. Um, a lot of the candidate pathogens are fusariums, uh, rhizoctonia, phytophoras, and pythiums. Um, another thing that we have seen in a lot of the work though is actually, um, it's not always an increase in disease, but can also be a decrease in some of your beneficial more, um, microbes that you find in your soil. So a muscular mycorrhizal fungi, um, and plant growth promote plant growth promoting rhizobacterias. Um, the issue obviously is that we don't have a lot of um, soil sterilant um, fumigants available anymore. And actually, you could argue we don't really want to be using those anyway because we know that we want better soil health, we want better soil communities. And actually, by putting fumigants in, you're killing everything. So. Um, we don't necessarily want to go back to a world of fumigants anyway, but we don't have a choice. There, there's none available. Um, um, and going back to Feli's talk earlier, um, rootstock genotypes differ in their response to ARD, and I'll be talking a bit more about that in the next couple of slides. Um, so a trial we did um, for a um, BBSRC Happy Project that finished a few years ago. Um, some of you may have heard us talk about this on previous um, tree fruit day presentations but it's a good example of where the problem is and some of the um, things that you can look at as growers if you are wanting to put a new orchard in um, on top of an old one. Um, we did a trial um, at Side Orchard in Worcestershire um, looking at various different rootstocks all with the same scion um, which was Worcester pear main in this um, trial. It was planted in autumn 2015, and then we went back over a number of years, um, both as part of the project, and then um, Chris Cook, a uh, former PhD student at East Morling, who's uh, now working, carrying on his work on apple replant in Washington State in the United States, um, went back as part of his PhD and took further measurements. Um, and what, what we could see immediately is, so this trial was looking at both the different rootstocks, but also 
um, planting in the interrow between the previous tree rows. Um, and what you can see here, um, clearly from these first two trees at the front of the slide here, is that there was a big difference. So the trees were paired, the rootstocks were paired um, with the, with one tree in the um, previous tree station and one in the alleyway. Um, and you can see here that there was a big difference um, between the tree in the um, tree station and that in the interro. Um, what, what's also interesting, you don't really see on this slide is that there, these trees are on a slope. Um, the trees nearest to us are in at the bottom of the slope and there is a water course a bit further down the slope just behind where this image was taken from. Um, so it also shows that the, and the differences that we saw were throughout the trial, but the biggest differences were at the bottom of the slope as well. So it shows that although we've got orchard to orchard variability, you've also got variability within orchard too. Um, looking at some of the data from um, this work, um, you can see that um, the orange bars are those in the tree station, the grey bars are those that were the trees where the trees were planted in the alley. And this is looking at the top um, chart is looking at the girth circumference and um, the bottom one the height of the leader shoot so the top height of the shoot um the top height of the tree sorry um and what we saw um is that the difference is less profound in the data for the girth and height than the actual canopy um unfortunately we didn't sort of we weren't able to take lots of um, measurements of the whole canopy size um, within this trial. We were just taking the height and the girth, um, which did show differences. And the main differences that we saw in this trial were in M116 and MM106, which showed the biggest replant effect. And that was interesting for us. Um, we were originally thinking that one of these um, rootstocks was um, likely to be more tolerant or resistant to ARD. But actually, our results showed that it's much more likely that um, that ARD is partially controlled genetically. So, if you've got um, if you've got the previous root stock, sorry, that was um, in the orchard was MM one hundred six, um, and M one one six is a relative is a um, a relative of MM one hundred six, where um, it the the cross was MM one hundred six and M twenty seven. And so it looks like it, picking the rootstock type that you use is very important based on what the rootstock type was in the previous um, trial. And I, I asked Feli a little question after her talk about um, was the M200 where they were seeing good replant effects, was that done in um, replant soil? where the previous trees were m9 because actually if m200 doesn't have particularly similar um parentage to m9 then perhaps that explains why you're seeing good um ard resistance or a tolerance to ard with using m200 so that was an interesting um based on Feli's talk earlier so effectively um the options really are when you're um, putting in a new orchard um, in an old orchard site is can can the tree are you taking all the structure out um, can the trees be moved to where the previous alleyways were so shifting everything half sort of three quarters of a meter or whatever um, or if not if they're going on similar old structures um, old um, tree uh, old sorry structures for your planting type um, and into the old tree stations, can you think about using a different rootstock type? Um, this then takes us on to other options for when those options are perhaps limited and you do want to say old rootstock type and you want to go in the same tree stations. Are there other things we can do to help with the establishment of trees, especially around issues around replant? Um, this takes us on to a large EU project that we're working on. Um, this is just, it started in uh, 2000 and we're just going into the final year of this project now. Um, the um, project is around um, enhancing the knowledge of soil biodiversity, um, looking at um, both effects um, by adding products and around other issues with the soil biodiversity. Um, and it's on multiple crop, apple, strawberry and tomato. The work we've been doing is purely on apple, but some of our partners in the project um, around Europe 
have been looking at strawberry and tomato. Um, and uh, as I say, it's a large project, um, 16 partners uh, across 11 different countries. Um, so the work we were doing um, was specifically looking at um, um, soil amendments we could put in at planting. Um, so we were looking at use base of uh, individual um, products and combinations of the products. Can some of the products, um, do they have synergistic effects? Um, can they, um, do they work cumulatively? Do they stop each other working from time to time is also a possibility when we're working with some of these products. Um, and so we were adding different types of um, beneficial microbes. Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi was one of them. Um, some of our initial um, results suggested that there was fairly low AMF levels as for natural inoculum here. Um, we were looking at um, PGPRs and some biocontrolled organisms, um, both bacterial and fungal. Um, the orchard was planted in April 2020, and on some of the trees, we also looked at re-inoculating where possible. Um, we didn't um, re-inoculate with AMF, um, although there is some work being done on other projects where we're looking at that, um, and but um, and potential ways that we can increase AMF in already established orchards. But we did um, re-inoculate some of the trees with the PGPRs and the biocontrol organisms. And then through the trial, we've been taking a um, range of different um, uh, measurements and samples. Um, we've been looking at yield. We've been looking at flowering time, seeing if there's a difference um, between first flower to last flower. Um, we've been doing girth measurements. We're looking at how, um, how big the trees get. And we will do a final season's worth of assessments on those um, factors this year. Um, one of the major things we've been looking at, though, is also by taking root samples from the trees and taking the rhizosphere um, soil. So that's the soil that surround the roots. It's the where you really have that interaction between the microbes in the soil and what's happening in the root of the tree. So we've been extracting DNA, um, sequencing that DNA alongside our partners in the project. And hopefully this um, time next year, when we um, present um, to you again, we'll hopefully be able to give you some real results. Um, or everything's kind of being analyzed at the moment. A lot of the data for this is being analyzed across the project. So it's looking at the various Apple trials across Europe, um, and then even combining it and seeing effects across all crop types for various different products. So all that data is currently being analyzed. As I say, we're into the last year of the project. Um, one little bit of data that we have got to show you for that, though, is around tree girth. Um, and so kind of using this as a proxy for establishment of the tree and how well the tree is growing. Um, and what we saw was actually um, by looking at, oh, sorry, this is tree girth and a number of fruit. And um, actually what we saw was generally um, there doesn't be seem to be a huge effect of um using both AMF and biocontrol, um, but actually um, by using um, by using uh, AMF um, against no use of AMF, it does seem to increase slightly um, the tree girth size, um, probably less obvious on the um, number of fruit per tree. Um, the biocontrol products, again, does seem to um, increase girth compared to um no use um but there doesn't seem to be much of an additive by using both of the products um and again on um number of fruit um the biocontrol um product does seem to increase the number of fruit slightly um, but again no great difference when it's then used with amf um, another thing that we were hoping to get better data on was looking at root stocks again, um, but also looking at root stocks um, and applying amendments to root stocks because um, we want to see whether some root stocks are more likely to be to work well with some of these amended amendment products um, than others. Um, but unfortunately, um, we had a large canker issue in this um, in this. Uh, planting uh awful lot of canker so 
we're, we're not sure how much usable data we're going to get out of this trial. It might be that we get some good canker data out of this trial, um, but that's to be looked at. We've got to look at the final numbers for that. Um, so there's a whole range of different organizations and companies been involved with our work on Apple Replant over the last few years, um, and also a number of researchers, both past and present this morning. So I'll finish there, Scott. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, we have no questions at the moment, but one thing I just wanted to say is as, as this information becomes available and results come through these projects, um, they will be updated in our annual review magazines. Uh, that is the 2023 copy that I have here. I, we're currently writing the 2024 version. And so we uh, that, that will be published in the spring. So please keep uh, keep your eyes open for that. Um, we'll, we'll move on because we've lost a bit of time, but I'm glad to say I think we've got Matt, Pat Rupert and Louise Robinson back. So if we can uh, share again with Matt, here we go. Matt, we've got you now. And if you want to try and hit the presentation, there we are. We're working. We can't hear you or see you yet, so I don't know if you can unmute and switch your camera on. Unmute camera on. We can hear you now. There we go. Sorry about that. My computer decided to just die. <laughs> so that's okay. We're glad we've got. We're glad we've got you back. And uh, yeah, so please tell us um, what you both have been working on with Apple Canker. Right. So I'm gonna first just go quickly through some Apple Canker facts before we go into the new um, research. So first. Um, fact for apple canker your sources of infections are the most important thing that you need to control and there are these cankers that you see on the screen uh, i'll try to put a pointer so the canker is you have an old part in the middle and the edge is the younger part and the younger part produces conidia which are splash dispersed a uh, short distance within the tree and between trees and if you let them mature cankers they will produce ascospores which can they fly long distance so mature cankers are a big no-no. You have to remove them as soon as possible to remove this long distance spread. And cankers will produce spores extremely effectively and extremely quickly. You need 30 minutes of rain to get about 1,000 to 10,000 spores produced on a canker. And you only need 10 spores to get a new infection. You have some other sources that you have in your orchards, like um, the fruit on the floor, the wind breaks, and all the pruning material that you leave in that may be infected when you cut it off or get, get infected later will produce spores and will infect your um, your trees. So the infection always happens through some wounds on the trees and they can be pruning holes, petals, scars, growth cracks and all sorts of things. And the most important take home message is that you have inoculum produced all year round in the UK. And you have wounds on the trees produced all year round in the UK, which spells disaster um, when it comes to canker, especially with our climate, where if you have one canker in a one hectare orchard um, and you leave it completely unmanaged, that one hectare orchard is going to have all trees with at least one canker in less than seven years. So management is super important. And the most effective management is the, to cut, cut the cankers out. And here I'll just um, do like a, um, in, by order of importance, when to do that, if you can. So before picking and during the picking is the most important time point because you remove inoculum for the picking wounds, for the pruning wounds and for the leaf scars. And then if you can afford to get after harvest and then midwinter tidy up and then the spring clean to prevent the, the spring infections, then you're gonna, if you do it year on year, within five years, you should reduce your canker to practically zero, but takes a lot of time and effort. So you cannot spray the canker away. Nothing will kill these lesions and prevent them from sporulating. You have to cut them out. You can reduce the rate of spread. So reduce, you can cover the wounds like leaf scars with captain or tabiconazole, and you will reduce their infection rate a bit, but Top, uh, like wounds, like picking or pruning wounds are almost impossible to target with a spray treatment and cannot be protected. So removal of inoculum is the only thing. But in the UK, we have sort of extremely tight uh, situation at the moment where we have a no more products almost for canker. We have Captain that is sometimes used already all applications for scab, 
and we have Tabiconazo, which only has one application on Apple. So we really need new products. And this is the first um, thing that we were doing. We are going to present three trials. I'm going to go right into it to save some time. So in the first trial that we did a couple of years back now, we looked at the, some of the biocontrol and some, some of the new fungicides that were not um, registered on Apple yet or not against canker. And we saw that one fungicide was actually quite good. When we artificially inoculate leaf scars to simulate high inoculum, or we left them naturally infected to simulate low inoculum level, in both cases, this fungicide uh, protected quite well, similar to standard here, and far better the water control that we had. And biocontrols were really not effect not effective. The, the, the bacillus and trichodermis that we tried this year were really not effective. Um, but at least one product was um, um, signposted as a potential new things that you could use. So with that idea, we moved then to a next trial, which happened for the last two years which we have even more different products. And we have now, again, biocontrols as trichoderma, urobacidium. Then we have some plant oils, plant extracts, and new um, um, new fungicides. And I just wanted to point out that boxes in green is where the the um, canker was reduced. We have, a very, we have various different situations, like we have rasp wounds naturally and... Um, artificially inoculated and we had leaf scars and leaf buds and pruning wounds and in our case leaf buds and pruning wounds were not protected by anything and um, interestingly if you look at all rasp wounds to put together then trichoderma significantly reduced canker in this trial and at a low um, infection rate, so naturally infected rasp wounds, low inoculum rate, the new azole uh, based fungicide also significantly reduced. The orange ones reduced a bit, but not significantly. So again, two products coming out from here that, that have some effect. Then we continued with the growing candle medway trials, which were young trees planted rather than um, done on older trees, were like the previous two trials. And here we again tried a lot of different things. Here now I can actually give you some of the some of the products that we tested. And again, biocontrols comparing to water or the standard, which are the first two, the biocontrols didn't really do much in this trial. Biostimulants, on the other hand, a little decrease versus control, but the, the only big winner in this trial was actually lime, which is hydrated lime building grate that we uh, dissolved at a five, uh, 50 kilograms per hectare and 300 liters of water. You have to know these are sort of two-year-old um, trees planted. Um, and um, apologies. And um, we um, used quite a low water ratio and was was enough to cover them. And what is important here is that the um, natural infections were protected, so low inoculum levels. But when we inoculated with high inoculum levels, even the lime couldn't protect. So inoculum levels are really important to keep it low um, in your orchards. <clears throat> so if you look at the summary of what new products you can have uh, on on as as your as your tools in the next couple of years, then biocontrols were we found many ineffective. One trichoderma was effective in some trials, but we need to do more trials with it to see how to apply when to apply. We are looking into new ways to use biocontrol as endophytes. So we have a bacteria and a fungal endophyte in our research pipeline, but that's a long way down the road. Um, we do have two new fungicides that have been effective or uh, uh, to some degree effective. And we have now this hydrated lime, which actually was used in New Zealand, is used in, um, in Netherlands in different ways. And we're now optimizing um, spray conditions and spray volumes to, to use it the most efficiently. But no tested product for the last six years that we've been testing will um, replace the current standard fungicide program. So we're going to have to combine them in the programs, which we're currently doing to some degree, and we're going to try to do it to more this year or the next couple of years. So with that, we're going to come to some other management factors that you need to pay attention when it comes to canker. And that is first is nutrition. So high nitrogen uh, content in the soil or in the tree will make your cankers far worse. Then you have nursery infections. So if you're planting new orchards, we know that between 
two to five trees come with at least one canker that is completely latent, so you don't see it at planting. Um, and which means that in the first couple of years, it's really important to patrol your new orchards and cut out all the cankers because that will then have a lasting effect throughout the orchard life. And then you have some more site specific factors that we're going to look in the next couple of minutes, which is soil type, nutrient balance, then soil and root microbiome, and then other stresses such as drought and waterlogging might affect your canker susceptibility of the orchard as well. So we have observed previously when we planted trees on several sites that they have very, very different symptom developments, canker symptom development, um, even though they were inoculated the same way when they were planted on different sites in Kent. So we decided to look into this a bit more in detail, and we got some funding from British Apples and Pears to do that last year, and we're still running this now. Um, where we collected soil analysis and canker severity data from commercial orchards and then analyzed which soil parameters correlate positively or negatively with severity in certain orchards. And now we're doing the validation step where we're going in and actually assessing canker and taking soil um, uh, measurements ourselves. So to give you a little bit of preliminary results, we have loads of challenges with that. And the first is getting enough data from um, commercial orchards and at the moment you only have data from southeast of England and even then only across 17 different farms so take home message number two is uh, we need more data from from you growers and, and agronomists and we have missing data um, from most of the most of the UK the second is actually the limitations of the soil data that we have. So most of the uh, things that are done on all sites are only pH, potassiums, um, phosphorus, and magnesium. So we're going to do some extra data data um, for that this year. But based on this data, we have about 100 orchards at the moment that we could use for analysis. And there is a little bit of regionality here. So it looks like there's some a region here much worse for canker. So this is canker number three mean, means is really heavy canker infestation. Canker one means no problem whatsoever. And two is where most of the orchards are, which is have some canker issues. Um, and then there is a variability within the two sites, the two massive regions that we have in. And when we look at the average potassium, we find most of the orchards that have canker of one, which is not a problem, have a potassium um, in the soil below 124 ppm, and most in the threes, twos and threes have above 124. So we think the potassium is could be an indicator of canker and need, will need to be ma managed better. Um, but we need to we'll need to work on that in the next couple of years. So what we really need your help to, to make this research more impactful and more um, um, more useful for you. So we need basically three things, a quick sharing consent from everybody that has done any soil analysis in your orchards, and then send our soil data to us to, to this um, email or straight to me, and then give us your best um, assessment of canker, which if you go to the form, you will get this, you will get the description how to do that. It's also if you take a picture of this QR code, you get to the form um, that is um, that has the description of the project and what we need but we really need this as soon as possible so we can get this wrapped up this year and with that i'm gonna pass to louisa to give you some other perspective on management of soil uh, for better canker um, resistant in the future okay thanks matt um so yeah as matt said um, we really are not going to have enough um, things that are controlling the canker in the future. So we need to start really looking at, at other methods and soil microbial amendments is certainly one of those. Um, so mycorrhizal fungi, for example, has been shown to really help with tree nutrition and water management, um, drought tolerance. And there is some evidence to suggest that it reduces some of the severity of um, apple canker. Trichoderma likewise um, has been shown to uh, have some effect on canker diseases and some of the, mat the work that Matt's been doing has, has confirmed this. So it's really important to look at different types of soil amendments, but equally how they 
work together because as Tom was saying earlier, they, that can have an effect on their function. So uh, as part of our Grand Kent Medway project, um, we're looking at two different, I'm gonna talk about two different main uh, work packages. So the first is looking at newly planted orchards. So um, as Tom said, in our Escalibur trial, we found that there was very low levels of mycorrhiza inoculum um, in the in the orchard soils. And that was not just in our orchard, but actually across Europe. So we saw that in commercial orchards, there's very, very little there, uh, slightly more in organic orchards, um, but certainly the conventional had very, very little. So we want to see how we can increase that microbial content within the soil. And particularly, we're looking at um, the effects of climate change. So there's a lot of data about drought, but there's very, very little data out in the, in the literature about waterlogging and how mycorrhizas can affect waterlogging. And clearly with climate change and uh, you guys out there have all been telling us for years, you know, what about waterlogging and how can we combat that? And it's really important for canker um, development as well. So we looked at um, different treatments uh, from mycorrhiza, uh, from plant works, and then Trichoderma hartsianum and tr Trichoderma um, atroviridae. So uh, what I must say is that these are very early data, really, that I'm showing. So this is all year one data. So things like yield are not um, particularly accurate at this stage. Um, one thing I should mention is that normally in the first year of a tree growth, we would expect some level of decrease if we're adding things like mycorrhiza because there's always a cost to the plant. Um, so it wouldn't be unexpected for us to see um, a reduction in that first year, both in the growth and the, and the yield. Um, but what we're seeing actually in the year one data is that we are having um, massive, massive differences um, between the way that these um, microorganisms are affecting the trees at different sites. And that's not really a surprise, as Matt was saying earlier. Uh, the results of his survey data are going to be really important to really drum down what is those differences between sites and how does it affect the microorganisms in the soil. So there was no um, significant difference in the treatments applied compared to the control, but we are seeing uh, differences between um, the different treatments. So there is something promising here of um, maybe we can start looking into these treatments and we're looking forward to year two data um, to, conf to confirm some of these. We also looked at uh, tree girth and once again you can see that there is this massive massive difference between the sites, how, um, how quickly the trees have grown, um, massive, it massively varies with, between the sites. Um, and again, the effects of those treatments, it's clear to see that they are some ups and downs between the sites. And like I said, we would expect, we would expect something like this to see a, a drop in the first year, um, which we are at this one site. Um, however, a lot of the other sites aren't showing massive drops and some are seeing slight, slight potential rises. As I say, it's year one data. Um, we need to confirm this, but it's, it's interesting to see how this very much changes um, with the soil um, at different places. When we looked at the canker, um, again, this is quite interesting really. So uh, we are starting to see, although not significant, we are starting to see trends of how the products are working against the canker. And there does seem to be a slight reduction as we uh, as we thought there might be with the mycorrhiza application. Now, as I say, this isn't significant and it's year one data. And you can see that this, again, varies massively between the sites. So this site here, for example, even though it's got the highest amount of growth, um, it's also got the highest levels of canker because of its situation. And we deliberately chose orchards that may not um, provide the best or optimal conditions because it was part of this experiment. They were all either wet or dry orchards. So it will be really interesting to see whether we can correlate the effects of the of the different treatments to the wet and the dry um, orchards and whether that has a has a massive effect going forwards. So in summary, um, there was no uh, significant positive or negative effects of adding either of the or any of the products on the growth yield or canker although we are starting to see some trends we're hoping to see whether how that correlates to the um, droughted uh, the, the 
orchards that are more susceptible to drought and the orchards that are more susceptible to water logging and how we can um, combat that. Um, there are huge differences between the sites. And I think along with Matt's work, that's going to become increasingly more interesting, really. But there's lots more assessments and analysis to do in 2024. So uh, watch this space. OK, so the second part of our Grand Kent at Medway um, was really to answer a question that I've been asked many, many times in forums like this of how can we get uh, microbiome amendment technology, so specific, specifically mycorrhizal fungi, into the roots of existing orchards. So the thing with mycorrhiza is it really needs to be added into the root and close in close proximity to a growing root in order to work. So the best time to add mycorrhiza is always going to be at planting in the planting hole and directly onto the roots. But there's lots of orchards and there's lots of situations where we want to amend that. And as Tom was talking about with our Escalibur project, there was lots and lots of things that were suggested at that time, but nobody really knows anything that that truly works um, for getting mycorrhiza in. So we're looking here at two different methods. And the first is using a adapted uh, root pruner with a stocks applicator on the back so that the roots are pruned and then the uh, mycorrhiza inoculum is, is uh, dribbled behind, uh, behind the blade in order to try and capture newly freshly growing roots at, at that point. And the second um, was to inoculate wildflower strips between the rows in the orchard. So this has been developed from some work that Michelle Fantin's team have done looking at um, wildflowers in orchards. And we've used a, um, a mix of wildflowers that would be good for other IPM strategies as well. So something that that team has been developing for a number of years now. One of the things that... Um, people struggle with with wildflower establishment is obviously the establishment part of it. And it's hoped that by adding the mycorrhiza, this will also help aid the establishment of those strips um, because it would hopefully make them more resilient to, to drought at key stages. So we've established these strips very well. Um, what we do find is that um, we get different domination of different species in different um, sites. So the two sites, have got quite quite different uh, covers at different times of the year. And when we've done an assessment, um, thank you, Selena, um, when we've looked at uh, those strips inoculated with mycorrhiza or those strips uninoculated mycorrhiza, we are seeing a difference. So we really need to drum down what those differences are, how that's going to affect the pollinators and work with the ENTO team to, to see how that's going to affect things in the future. But the nice thing is, the wildflowers have established very well at all sites um, and they're looking very good, actually. So uh, this is very, very early data um, with just one orchard's worth of trees. So we can't take too much from it. But I think it's interesting to see that um, the effects of root pruning and wildflowers do certainly have an effect on different um, quality assessments that we've taken. And there is quite a trend where, for example, the root pruning will have an effect on fruit diameter and fruit weight. And again, with the wildflowers, we are seeing slight reduction, but in all situations, we're seeing an improvement when we add the mycorrhiza back again. And especially with the wildflowers, there seems to be a big improvement over the control. Um, again, with the sugar levels, uh, we saw the same trend there. So although very, very early data, it does show that there is something happening there. Um, we are quite pleased to see there are some differences coming along um, and it will be interesting to see next year how that uh, continues to affect the actual tree health and the fruit, fruit health and the fruit quality going forwards. This is uh, even earlier results, uh, i.e. collected this week. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to show it. But uh, the nice thing that we've uh, seen, we've collected the roots from the wildflowers. And what we can safely say is that a lot of the wildflower roots are jam packed with mycorrhiza. So the species that Michelle is using are certainly mycorrhizal. You can see the mycorrhizal structures here. You can see the hyphae, you can see the vesicles. And then if you look carefully, you can actually see the arbuscules within the roots. So I'm really pleased to see that actually we have got a lot of colonization going on. Um, 
the wildflowers are certainly um, happy to take up and colonize with the mycorrhiza um, and they're definitely a, a good option for the future. So in summary then, trees and existing orchards, we've so far got very good wildflower establishment. There is differences in those wildflowers between orchards, which we would expect, um, and between positive and negative for mycorrhiza. So uh, whether they've been inoculated at planting or not. Um, and the very early results show that uh, there is something hopefully quite interesting here, uh, but you'll have to wait till 2024 to, to find that out. Okay, uh, so I'll do the acknowledgements of this section and then hand you back to Matt. Um, but there's lots and lots of people that we need to thank for this work um, that are below, particularly our team um, and all the work that they do. Uh, Grand Kent Medway for funding us, Bapple for funding us. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Louisa. Um, yeah, just we, we're going to have to move on in the interest of time, but there's quite a lot of useful chat coming through and some questions for Louisa and for Matt. So perhaps uh, over the next few minutes, you can answer those. Uh, because we're running short of time, uh, Matt, um, hopefully you can deliver your talk on control of brown knot and cherry in about 10 minutes. Is that yeah, possible? Yeah, I'll, I'll give my best. Thank we will you. skip what the brown rot is because most of the growers and agronomists here know very well what the big problem is. I'm just going to say on the epidemiology of brown rot, and we're talking about Mondrinia laxa here, in uh, that it, it really the, the problem is they can infect intact fruit directly, not uh, not like other Mondrinia that needs wounds, and it's um, it will and every fruit will become susceptible as soon as they be begun coloring. Um, and big problem is sort of similar to with canker, the continuous supply of inoculum throughout the year from, from infections in this year, from mummified fruit, from twigs with cankers on, from fruit, fruit, fruit on the ground. So you have tons of inoculum all, all the time in, um, in your orchards if it's not very, very, very clean. What can we do? Um, there's a chemical sprays that we can do with blossom um, or on the fruit or even post harvest, which is what we're going to have a look. We can use some new biocontrols to stop the resistance emerging in monolinea, which is a big problem already. And we can do physical control measures such as removal disposal of inoculum, which is really the, the big um, improvement. And then for on the later stages, we can we're going to talk quickly about what we're trying to do in finding the latently infected fruit at, at, at the peak um, time and to and remove it so you don't it doesn't spoil your whole batches of fruit in the in the cold store. So the first part, okay, we're going to talk about post-harvest fruit dipping trial. So the aim here was simple: test some fungicides, biocontrols, and sterilants. Um, to see if post-harvest dipping, as is the, the similar way is done in, I believe, in Spain and in, um, and potentially in France, um, if it helps post-harvest uh, rot. And we didn't look at just the brown rot here, but all rots. And we had um, sweetheart commercially collected that we inoculated. And then the next day, we uh, dipped the fruit for 30 seconds quickly in different suspensions at the recommended rate. Um, and these products were these products were sort of all off the shelf. And then we stored the fruit for 18 days in plus one to plus two degrees at 99% humidity, um, which is the longest storage I think that you would you would attempt um, for cherry. And then we had then eight days of sort of shelf life storage, in which would be sort of the worst case scenario for um, um to, to simulate like a, what's happening in the store. And then we assessed all the rods that we saw and we checked chemical residue analysis on fruit as well. So we saw when it comes to healthy fruit, if you just cold store it, most of the products increased slightly over the, um, the one is your control. So you have more healthy fruit with products, but there is very, very few rods if you have a good storage. So only two to two to five percent of fruit that all fruit were went clean into the into the storage so there was no fruit with any sign of rots in but then after you do additional eight days of, of shelf life storage then only 50 percent of the fruit in the untreated controls which is one and two are actually um without any rots 
fungicide treatments three and four uh, were very good. More than 75% of the fruits still without rots. And then the other treatments in between, but they are all better apart from the sterilant here. They were all better than untreated. But this is far better shown here where you can see how effective different products were against different rots that we saw. And the very effective means that we're above 75% of the fruit after 18 days plus eight were still rot free and then moderately effective and slightly effective or not effective at all. So as you can see, what is striking is that there's some products that are very effective against most of the things, but other molds such as mucor cladosporium, not effective at all. And then other fungicide like this fungicide number four was only very effective against brown rot and not 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 very effective against the other things biocontrols again not as effective as fungicides but had moderate efficiency efficacy against brown rot and in some case very good efficacy against botrytis so you need to know which rots are um at high risk in your different orchards when you choose this new uh, alternative products but basically what we learned, and you can, if you take a picture of this, or this is the link to the full report that we that we done for AHDB, what, it, what we conclude is like, if you have a very good storage and you put clean fruit in the storage, then most of the fruit comes clean out of the storage. Um, but you can add to that with the products that we tested, or but sterile and improved, improved significantly the amount of healthy fruit that you get out of storage plus eight days of shelf life. And the best protection, of course, was the fungicides three and four, which after we had done the pesticide analysis um, on the pesticide residue analysis, none of the treatments that we did exceeded any MRLs that were way below. So we recommended both of them for EMU for post-harvest cherry protection. Now, biocontrol was effective to much lesser extent, and it was more rot specific. So some products were only effective as some rot and not the other. So this risk assessment of which rot is a huge problem in which orchard might be required to, to pick the right product. But when it comes to biocontrol, um, I just wanted to throw in what Sophia did a couple of years back. It was they published two years ago now, where she, rather than applied biocontrol on the fruit, she applied biocontrol on the ripening fruit in the orchard and see how that affects post-harvest um, um, post harvest rot, in this case, brown rot that she put, that she inoculated. And she found that the two um, different microorganisms, so a bacillus and a urobacidium yeast, they were both isolated at NIAP, were compared to a fungicide, and they both offered versus unprotected control, they both offered between 50 to 30 to 60 percent reduction in the rot um, when you apply biocontrol in the at like two weeks before pick in the orchard and then you just pick and store the 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 fruit so that is quite um, encouraging and it's better than other biocontrols that we know of uh, and that's sort of in the pipeline to get it to market but it's just um, a, a side side note here that might be useful in a couple of years and the last thing I want to say really is that we're trying to now detect uh, or make a tool, make a proof of concept tool for non-destructive detection of brown rot. So if you imagine my ideal um, outcome from this project will be, this is like a collaboration with the University of Kent, that you have a sorter that scans the fruit as it's coming um, and can sort the ones that have, that they, they look absolutely fine, but have a latent infection with brown rot. And we're doing that with actually using um, optical coherence tomography, which many of you with glasses, including myself, will do every two years when you get your eyes checked. And they 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 look that your eyes is healthy and is completely non-destructive. You walk away with your eyes intact. And what you see are uh, pictures here. This is actual cherry fruit from my PhD student. And he can see the cells within the fruit with this very quickly. And we hope that we, with some um, AI and some high throughput imaging, we might have a, in a couple of years, a portable scanner that you could just plug onto your uh, conveyor and it might be able to notify you the high risk fruit or, or actually sort it for you. And um, this is something that we're quite excited about and it might um, work together with these new biocontrols that are less effective 
And with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish here. I hope I did it in ten minutes. And if you have any questions, you can email me. I'm gonna try to answer them now. Um, and the report again, if you wish, um, is in the QR code here. Matt, thank you so much indeed, uh, and particularly for swiftly getting through that presentation. It's very clear. So again, all of this work, and, and I think also looking back to the canker work that you've pre presented, it's ongoing. It's frustrating for everyone that we can't get um, things moving more quickly, but I'm afraid with the type of work you're doing, it does take time, doesn't it? And uh, yeah. Yeah, there, there is not a quick way of achieving the, the results that we're looking for. Matt, thank you so much. Um, do hang around and look at the chat to see if there's any further questions for you. But uh, we will move on final to our final presentation of this morning's session. And something slightly different, uh, Celine Silva also works with us at NIAB in the Pest and Pathogen Ecology team. Um, we have spoken in recent years about the Bespoke project many times actually, and a huge amount of good work was done by Michelle Fountain's team looking at the use of wildflowers to enhance beneficial insects as well as pollinating insects. A part of that project um, required um, scientists at NIAB to actually try and find uh, optimum wildflower mixes to suit pollinating insects for different fruit crops. And Celine Silva is going to tell us a little bit about how that was done and what we've achieved. So Celine, um, hopefully you're out there. I think you're sharing now as I speak. We're just waiting yes. for Celine's presentation to come up. Um, Am I unmuted? Yeah, we can hear you now, Celine, but we can't yet see your, or I can't see, uh, we can see you. Ah, uh, there we are. We have lift okay. off. So Celine, tell us a little yeah. bit about what you've been what you and your colleagues have been doing on this yes so today i'm going to talk about uh work we did on tree fruit pollination and we have started this many years ago so i'm going to go through some of the points of of those those uh, projects so i will just quickly go through establishment of the wildflowers so so far there are three key points that we focus on. So the seed selection, the preparation of the soil, and then the, the actual sowing. Um, the seed selection, basically we just recommend as much wildflower species as you can in percentage in the mix, but we do know that sometimes it comes at the cost. So you can either decrease the rate of sowing that you are using, and uh, we would advise you to speak to whoever, uh, whatever company supplies you with the seeds and they will be more than helpful with that. Uh, you can also add some grasses if the rate uh, is low. So there are things you can do to decrease the cost of, of sowing a wildflower mix. The preparation, so preparation and sowing as clean as soil as you can get. So if, if, you get your soil free of weeds that, that will give you a better chance of successful establishment. We have been more successful with sowing in late summer. We did a few sowings in spring. Uh, some were successful, some were not, and we had had uh, more success with late summer, so that's what we recommend at the moment. Um, these are the key points. You can find a guide in bespoke uh, uh, websites. Uh, there are there are many many helpful guides on that website that you can use to establish your wildflowers. So just for an example, these are some of the sites we have worked on before that have wildflowers. These are uh, sites where we established the wildflowers and then monitored through as much as we could to see if the coverage uh, was successful. And even in some of them, when the coverage was low, uh, we were able to increase the, the coverage of the mix that we applied uh, in subsequent years. So it's not always the fact that it starts very low and you have to redo it all again. Uh, a careful management, so if you, are careful, don't cut too often, uh, and and uh, that could could still be useful and it could still become a successful um, wildflower. So moving on to crop 
uh, pollinators and wildflowers. So of course the most known are bumblebees and honeybees. So bumblebees, fluffy, hairy, and uh, honeybees, you have that chunky back leg that you can see uh, on the picture. And those two pollinators, they collect pollen in a specific way. So they use their saliva to actually fix the pollen to their legs. So it's quite secure. They're very successful. A good, good, uh, good collection of pollen. And then we have the solitary bees or the ground nesting bees. They collect pollen in a different way. Uh, they use the hairs on their body to actually collect the pollen. So they don't use saliva. So in a way, they are more, uh, they have a bigger probability or it, they are better suited for pollination because when they land on a flower, they will be leaving traces of pollen. So pollination can be more successful uh, when, when uh, ground nesting bees are involved. So this takes us to a project that we did a few years ago where we looked at increasing uh, bare ground in orchards uh, to see if we could increase also populations of wild pollinators uh, of ground nesting bees. And uh, although we did to an extent uh, had more nests, what we found and the most useful information was that most of the nests were under the trees. So in the row under the trees, the herbicide uh, part under the trees. And that means that the resource is already there in your orchard. As long as you keep it fairly bare or with very low uh, vegetation, you can probably create an habitat and improve your, your, your chances of having wild pollinators nesting under the trees. This uh, is a published work and it's online and you can access it uh, uh, very easily. We used the same orchards. They also had those orchards. Some of them had floral uh, resources next to them. So we used those orchards in subsequent years to look at what pollinators were uh, visiting the crop and the floral area. So here you see quite a few bee, uh, honeybees visiting the crop. This was done at apple blossom. So there wasn't a lot of flowers available in the, the wildflower area, but you can see that still there was, there was um, pollinators using that area, bumblebees, honeybees, uh, overflies, solitary bees. There's, there's, uh, there's quite a diversity uh, to be to be um, used. We also looked at plum. Uh, there isn't much out there of pollinators in plum. And again, this was a plum orchard where we had shown uh, floral alleyways. So the resource was already there and we were able to monitor for two years and we got different results. And that's mainly because blossom occurred in almost uh, four weeks uh, time in uh, of difference in those two years. So in March, 2020, uh, we recorded bumblebees, honeybees, uh, overflies and solitary bees, uh, more or less in, in, in similar numbers. And then in April, 2021, there was a huge jump in the number of solitary bees that we recorded. And this shows that depending on when your uh, crop flowers, you might be having more or less pollinators. So it is important to have a diversity because those pollinators will also have a cycle and they'll also need a specific uh, habitat or a specific, uh, specific conditions. So it's always important to have diversity of pollinators, not just one. If that one then uh, is not present, you could have problems and deficits of pollination. Through Bespoke, and you have the, the website address on the slide, you can find many guys, like I said before, 
Um, Michelle Fountain and Sarah Arnold produced some uh, guides of pollinators for each uh, for a various number of crops and which wildflowers they most likely um, visit. So here you have the major UK pollinators and the list includes two bumblebees, so two bombas, and the andrina that you see here on the list are nesting, uh, ground nesting bees. So again, you find them to be very good pollinators of apple in this case. You also have two overflies. And if you look to your right, uh, you'll see a list of flowers that can be, uh, that are could be preferential for those pollinators. If you go on the website, you can also find if you see here on the last column, you can see uh, a few letters and that's also cross-referenced with pests. This is a general uh, pest uh, index. So some of those pests won't be relevant to your crop, but if you go online and cross-reference with that, you can see if that species uh, is of interest to you. The same was done for pears. So again, one of on the list of bumblebee and you have four ground nesting bees. So again, uh, the importance of ground nesting bees uh, in pollinators, in pollinations. The same was done with cherry. And also again here, uh, two bumblebees and four of the ground nesting bees. Uh, and other flies also uh, for cherries. So I'm just gonna go quickly through pest control with wildflowers. That's also a work we've been doing for many years. And we did establish uh, alleyways of wildflowers uh, in a few orchards. We monitored uh, through three years. And what we found was that uh, uh, we had quite a few benefits. So here, all the greens are good benefits, are good uh, consequences of the wildflower area. Uh, I should say that this is compared to an area where it didn't have wildflowers. So here, for example, when you say more hoverflies, there were more hoverflies in the area with wildflowers compared with the area without wildflowers. And we had quite a good uh, results in reducing cuddling moth, dam cuddling moth damage, increasing lace wings that are a good predator. But then we got to 2020 and we had uh, a few negative effects. I should say that the woolly apple leaf that we recorded was only in a few sites and not in all of them. So it might be site dependent and not uh, wildflower uh, dependent. And, and by 2020, some changes had occurred also in the wildflower and that's why we would like to monitor uh, for longer. Uh, of course, the wildflower is in the habitat and it's not static and every year it changes. So that's that needs a bit more research. So we also looked at uh, predatory spiders because spiders there is always a big number of spiders in, in orchards. And we found that where we had wildflowers, uh, there was more of orb weaver spiders that are predatory and significantly more uh, money spiders that predate in soft-bodied um, insects like aphids. So key points. Uh, establishing a wildflower is always uh, an investment. You need to plan, you need a bit of later at the beginning, but you can always, uh, if it's successful, you can get a, quite a few different benefits uh, from pollination to uh, pest control. Uh, you can also see that when the wildflower is placed inside the crop, so alleyways, and, and we would very much like to try tunnels, um, it, it has a bigger impact and a better, uh, better outcome uh, for the crop. And that's it. I hope you enjoy it and I'm free to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Celine. Um, there's been useful chat uh, in the chat forum with Michelle has put some good links in there to the Bespoke website, which I have to say is absolutely fantastic. Please go on the Bespoke website and use the guides and evaluation tools that uh, our NIAB staff uh, and others from the other partners from the other EU countries involved with the project 
have uploaded there. Um, they are really, really useful. Please do take time to have a look at those. Um, Celine, just watch the chat, perhaps see if you've got any more specific questions. But given we've run over time, I apologise due to some technical problems this morning. We will now break for lunch. Um, we are going to reconvene at quarter past one, so that's half an hour. And uh, please come and join us back at 1.15. In the meantime, we will have our reel running with some information about NIAB and the work that we do. Uh, we'll see you all after lunch. Thank you.